Before we start, I want to thank Michael, a viewer of this channel, for sending me my new microphone. This was on my Amazon wish list, and I have been meaning to upgrade the sound on my channel for a while. Michael watches the channel, is new to D&D, and has found the videos really helpful. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, going on the list and sending this through. I literally got this yesterday. I am just recovering from COVID, so I'm now uh, getting back up and running, filming videos again, and having a microphone uh, for me to do all these new videos with is really, really helpful. So thank you so much, Michael. I am definitely gonna get use out of this immediately. Now on with the show. This is going to be a weird episode for me because normally I share my thoughts based on experiences I've had at the table. Not counting the Critical Role Demystified videos, if I share advice on this channel, usually it's something I've tried. But today's topic is something that I keep meaning to do in my games, but I've never gotten around to it. And in fact, this video finally gave me the excuse I needed to do the prep so that I could actually employ this technique in my games. But while I haven't actually done this at my tables yet, I really wish I had, and I really think it would work. I've been thinking about this for years, I just never have done it. See, I've been playing 5th edition since it came out 8 years ago, and since then I've DM'd or played in 3 total party kills. I've also caused some near wipes, where just one or two characters were left standing. But those aren't so bad, because your players usually know where the story should go from there. Your remaining characters will pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and then go for some well-armed strangers that are standing conspicuously near the bounty board in the tavern. Well, they might not know exactly how it's going to happen, but they know they are going to cross paths with the other player's replacement characters. Or they'll just be high enough level that they will try to resurrect the fallen characters. Unless you have a specific approach to death in your campaigns that every player is aware of before you start playing, which I recommend you do, but that is a subject for another video entirely, then that's the scenario you can expect when a few player characters die at once. But a total party kill is different. When a TPK hits your party, the group is usually left stunned. And while your players might feel that it's only natural that the campaign ends after a TPK, Especially old school players who have been through earlier editions of the game where the vibe was much less heroic fantasy and much more get good and survive. For them, and for you, it might be totally fine for your campaign to simply end after the TPK. But that doesn't mean that it has to. My first TPK happened during a, well, at the end of a Tyranny of Dragons campaign. Just a few sessions earlier, half the party had been wiped out in the caves next to the war camp. The party retreated, licked their wounds, picked up the new player characters, and went back to the caves. But this time, all four player characters died. Now, aside from the normal things that happen after a TPK, mainly shock, indignation, and a little bit of blame, our group was just kind of stunned. And I asked the players if they wanted to jump ahead a little bit in the campaign to another point in the story, and pick up there with new characters. But I think because they had already been through a near wipe with the two party members getting killed, and then to have a total party kill in the same adventure, I think they were just ready to move on to something completely different. And while I'm still a little annoyed that neither of my Horde of the Dragon Queen campaigns really got very far before they fizzled out for one reason or another, I do think in this case it was the right call. So that's the first lesson I learned. It ultimately has to be the player's decision whether or not to try to return to the existing campaign or to move on and play something new. It has to be their choice whether this story continues or not. My second example of a TPK came about a year ago when the first batch of characters in our Storm King's Thunder campaign met their untimely end. We decided to take on some enemies that, in hindsight, the DM was trying to hint to us very strongly were too powerful for us to face. But I honestly think our plan would have worked if we just had not rolled absolute crap. My fighter hit with maybe one attack across like five rounds of combat. It was bad. And when our characters were dead, we started talking about what we wanted to do next. The big question was whether we wanted to pick up in the middle of this campaign with new characters or switch to a different story. This, by the way, was the same group as the Tyranny of Dragons campaign, the same group experiencing a TPK. And because of that experience, we knew we always had the option to pivot to something else. So anyway, the Storm King's Thunder characters were dead, and we needed a little bit of a chance to figure out what was going to happen next. And we did ultimately decide that because we were pretty close to the end of that campaign, we would just pick up new characters where these ones left off, 
and finish it out. But that's another lesson. After a TPK, really after any character death, but especially a entire group death, you need to give the players a chance to feel their feelings. Even though D&D is just a game. And it's the kind of game where we always say things like, well, there's no winning or losing, you're just trying to have fun with your friends and tell a cool story. The TPK still kind of is the ultimate lose condition. And some people might feel some emotional burnout and not feel that excited about jumping into the same story with some new characters. And you have to honor that. Respect the party's wishes about how to proceed and leave it to the group about what they want to do next. You can reassure them that you have a plan to get them back onto the story as smoothly as possible. And let them know that there are some specific story beats that you are really excited to hit and, you know, that you're excited to share with them. But you can't make the decision for them. My final TPK story came when I was running a West Marches style game during the lockdown. One group went on a mission and they very quickly got taken down by a horde of goblins. Now, nobody hit three death saving throw failures and nobody was critted on, but all five party members were rendered unconscious and left bleeding out in the snow. And I could have totally just left it there. After all, the goal of the campaign was to do something that felt a little bit more old school, but my modern storytelling instincts kicked in and I decided to throw them a bone. The party woke up tied to a post in the middle of the goblin village and a portal opened up nearby. A tall, thin, green-skinned, pointy-eared humanoid stepped through the portal and the goblins handed over the wizard's spell book. The wizard saw this and spoke up, saying something like, um, excuse me, can I have that back? That's mine, hello. This alien creature stepped up to him and, in crude sign language, made a deal with the wizard. If the players went into a nearby haunted monastery and retrieved six spell scrolls and brought them back to this creature, it would take them and return the spell book. Sure, it was a contrivance, but I could also make the case that it was believable based on the circumstances. This alien being just wanted things from the monastery, but the goblins were too scared to go in. This was already true, I already had that in my notes. My justification came in with the idea that this wizard was only level one, so he didn't really have a ton of spells in his spell book. And this creature probably already had a fair number of level one spells. He wanted something more interesting, more juicy. He wanted the higher level spells in the monastery. Those were more valuable to him than the spell book. It made the player extremely motivated to put together a group of characters to go on a mission to raid the monastery, which was the goal of the campaign, to give the players the opportunity to set their own objectives and have self-directed missions. And by navigating around the total party kill, I gave them a new mission, which moved the narrative forward. Plus they got to see more of what was going on with the goblins, so it was a little bit more satisfying. Now I think that worked really well, but I wish I had not had to wing it when it had happened. I wish I'd actually gotten around to doing the thing that I'm going to talk about in this video. I wish I'd had a red envelope. This is a simple red envelope. You can get them from staples in huge numbers, but what's inside is your way out of a TPK. Once the TPK has happened and the dust has settled and the characters are dead, you present this red envelope, but you don't open it yet. Remember what we learned from the Tyranny of Dragons game. It has to be your player's choice whether they want to continue with this campaign. Hold up the red envelope and ask, do we want to close the campaign there? Or do you want to know what happens next? Now, that approach might not work for your players, you know them better than me, but I think that technique would work for the people I play with. And tell them, you don't have to decide right now, but if you want to keep going with these characters, we can do that. If they say yes, and only if they say yes, don't show them what's inside if they say no. But if they say yes, open up the red envelope and read it aloud. Inside, you have a scene that describes these characters waking up from being dead. But just like the wizard goblin spellbook scenario, it's not a super convenient situation. You're giving them a second chance, but you're also taking something from them or putting them in a tough situation they have to find their own way out of. In fact, I think you kind of have to do that so the players don't feel like you're giving them too much too easily or too early in the campaign. So for example, here's one scenario that I've written. Your party, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to read that part. As the sounds of battle die away, silence surrounds you. Then a new sound, the sound of singing, a hymn. Light floods around you and your eyes snap open. You're lying on a cold altar, looking up into a stained glass window. Sunlight dances above you, filling your vision with swimming colors. You look around. Your allies lie on the cold stone floor, unconscious, but breathing. They have already been revived. You look at where the voice came from. 
A priest stands over you, his white robes trimmed with gold. His gray hair falls around his shoulders, and his piercing blue eyes are framed by crow's feet. You and your friends have been through quite an ordeal, but we recovered your bodies and were able to call upon our holy faith to bring you back to life. Rest. He places a hand on your shoulder. And once you have your strength, we can begin to discuss how you and your friends will work off your debt. His smile widens, his crow's feet crinkling. After all, a company of mercenaries left for dead who now owe the temple their lives? We can think of all manner of uses for your unique skill sets. There are always unholy monsters, or enemies of the church. You'll be back in the fight in no time. Now this is by no means the only scenario you can use in your game. You might have some specific characters or locations or items that would tie well into a mass regeneration or resurrection. But in case you need a little bit of guidance, I've got you covered. I've written six more of these scenarios. And you can download the PDFs for all seven scenarios on my Patreon, just by joining at the $3 a month level. They're generally designed so that some of them work better for low-level play, like the one we just saw, others are more suitable for mid-level adventurers, and a couple are ideally suited for a high-level campaign. And these scenarios have more than just the scene that I read to you. They have NPCs, secrets, and even a little bit of lore you can drop into your campaign if you want. You can pick whichever one you like the best and just keep the envelope behind your DM screen until the day you might need it. You could also, if you want, pick a couple of these scenes and have them ready. That way you could open a different envelope depending on the circumstance of the TPK. For example, if the PCs die somewhere remote, you might decide the members of the clergy can't really reach them. So for that scenario, you might have a backup envelope with your second favorite option, one that works better for the characters dying out in the wilderness. Or, and this would be wild, but kind of awesome, you could have all of these scenes in matching unmarked envelopes. And that way you wouldn't actually know how your players will get resurrected until you open up the envelope at the table. That would freak me out, but that might be just the element of randomness you need to be excited because it keeps you on your toes. Either way, this is definitely something I'm going to do when I run my next campaign. And if you want to write scenarios like this for your own campaign, but you're not sure how to write the dramatic language or evocative descriptions, then you should check out today's sponsor, Describe. They have more than 7,000 scenes and their professional writers are adding new scenes all the time. These can be read aloud at your table to describe monsters and locations and spells and magic items and even dialogue. In fact, you could go to Describe and find a scene for your dying words, a scene for a resurrection spell being cast, a scene to describe the feeling of having a resurrection spell cast on you, and a post-resurrection quip, which means they have you covered from one end of the death resurrection transaction all the way to the other. Visit Describe.com slash SuperGeek and use the code SuperGeek at checkout to get 10% off of your first subscription payment. That is D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com slash SuperGeek. Thank you so much to Describe for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I really hope it was useful. By the way, if you are playing remotely, you don't have to put these scenes into a red envelope if you don't want to. But that being said, it is very cool if you do. Along the lines of props and handouts, some of you have asked what I bring to my D&D games or what I keep behind my DM screen. But much like the red envelope, that is something that I am still trying to figure out. My style has completely changed over the past two years of running games entirely online. And right now I'm trying to figure out what I would actually bring with me to a physical game. So you might have to wait a little bit longer to get that video because it's taking me a little while to feel things out and see what feels right. But I'll know more once I get a chance to actually play a few more in-person games and try some things out. So hopefully soon. If you want to support the channel, there are four ways you can do that. The first is to subscribe and ring the bell. This lets YouTube know that you want to see more of these videos and it helps you get the videos the moment they come out. You can join my Patreon, any dollar amount helps the channel, but at $3 a month you get access to Patreon live streams and you get access to this stuff, the D&D content that I make for you. At $5 a month, you get these videos at least a few days early. And at some point, there's going to be some Patreon-specific bonus videos as well. And at $10 a month, your name goes into the credits for each piece of D&D content I make for the patrons. Third way to support the channel is by joining my Discord. We have a really cool community of people, and they are really supportive, and they're putting together games, and they're sharing advice, and we would love to have you be a part of that. And the fourth and final way you can help support the channel is by signing up for my newsletter. The links for all of that are in the doobly-doo below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, play fair and have fun.